Okay, then uh, good afternoon from the Orpheus Institute in Ghent, which is one of my two current places of work. My name is Jonathan Impit. I'm director of research here, um, but also, uh, uh, what am I? Associate professor at Middlesex University. So it's uh, very pleasing to be playing on home turf this afternoon. I'll introduce my colleague, friend and colleague Juan Para. Uh, we're going to play in a few minutes. Um, I'll explain something about what we're going to do and the reasoning behind it. Um, I'm sorry we can't be there in person. By sheer coincidence, we're actually running another conference, an online conference from here at, uh, at the same time, precisely the same days. Um, I hope Adam will send a message if uh, you can't hear me properly. Uh, Juan tells me that uh, to use an SM58 appropriately, I need to really stand uh, like this. And the only words I know to say when standing like this are, uh, they begin, uh, and now the time has come, uh, I can't get no, and uh, testing, testing. But I'll try and, uh, I'll try and talk about something else instead. Um, so we're, uh, we're billed as talking about the material of improvisation. Uh, the project that we're engaged upon is called Three States of Wax, a slightly enigmatic title that I hope I'll be able to explain uh, over these few minutes. Why are we so interested with the, in the material of improvisation? Well, because as you can see from the table full of, uh, of wires here, we're working with technology, which is a lot of what we do. Technology uh, requires of us to be very specific uh, about we're talk what we're talking about. Um, technological practice is inherently critical in many ways. Uh, it obliges you to question assumptions, concepts, constructs, how you imagine what you talk about, what you're doing. Uh, it's no use just to uh, ask a computer to play something a bit like this or to listen to what you're doing and uh, make something intelligible out of it. You actually have to think through what you mean by these things. They're very literal animals, computers. Uh, the fact that they can't generate uh, random numbers, of course, is, um, is symptomatic, is an indicator of, of this situation. On which subject? I want to talk about three things, really. One is the critical nature of technology. One is to suggest that actually the way we normally talk about improvisation, um, perhaps that moment has passed, perhaps we need to think of other terms. And the third is to discuss uh, the nature of material as reflected through the use of, of technology. Cage's term, indeterminacy, has uh, resurfaced as a, as a topic recently in respect of, of, of work with technology particularly. It's many, in many ways, it's a parallel strand to discussion of improvisation, particularly through the 50s, 60s, 70s. One stresses the non-intentionality of the individual, the other pure intentionality. One is a liberation from inherited aesthetics. The other is more explicitly social, although it's worth bearing in mind that Improvisation as such doesn't really become a, a topos in jazz, which doesn't mean they weren't doing it and weren't appreciating it, but it's not discussed in those terms until, until, until the 1940s. But either way, whether we're talking about indeterminacy or improvisation, they would tend to focus on the freedom, the liberation, the autonomy of the moment and of the individual. Now, heavily involved with improvisation as I am, I want to suggest that these depend on, on caricatures of reference practice, caricatures that are, are no longer useful. But perhaps my motivation is, in fact, social. What we think of as improvised music exists among a range of contemporary music practices from the most explicitly deterministic and individually virtuosic to, I don't know, experimental, environmental installations with, with no apparent human involvement. And how we talk about improvisation relative to all these other modes tends to be 
informed, impeded even, by what I think of as a cult of individualism, of some kind of, of um, autonomy of freedom of expression. Which is not to say that the subject, the improviso is who we're talking about, is not central to improvisation. But if we each practice, do our practice, carry out our practice in our own cell, then, then nothing happens. Art cannot do its work. And there's an interesting literature on this. I respect your thing, you respect my thing, we each do our own thing. Um, Agamben, Badiou, people like this, they question, well, if that's the case, if art was so important, say, to Plato, uh, that the artist really had to be treated as a dangerous, uh, a dangerous instrument, then how come now we're freer than ever as artists? And frankly, it seems to make little difference to, uh, to anyone. That's their question. So we want art to do its work. Some kind of commonality is crucial. Some kind of discourse is crucial. The many practices of contemporary music, and I beg forgiveness for the non-musicians among us, but I, I'm sure you can uh, extrapolate much better than me to, to your particular sphere of activity. These many practices must in some ways uh, be able to be considered commensurable. Otherwise, we cannot have a true discourse of what we're, what we're currently engaged in. So you might think of this in terms of two caricatures, the score, the score that determines everything and is, is performed in some way by human automata. Of course, it's not true. The score does not determine everything. There are some wonderful examples from Mahler, from Stravinsky, where you might imagine this is the most richly uh, possible determined uh, set of instructions. And of course, the more you put in, the more questions are asked about what is missing. Or at the other end, free improvisation, a caricature of free improvisation where, where the soul of the subject pours out in some sort of continual restarting. Now, neither are true or even possible, but they often, uh, they often resurface in, in discussion of improvisation-related topics. So how can we reconcile, I don't want to say these caricatures, but these different practices? Well, my proposal is to start with, with the sound itself, the experience, the phenomenon. This is determinate. If a sound happens, it happens. If someone hears it, they hear it. Uh, and there's nothing, there's nothing inherent in uh, an individual sound uh, to indicate whether it was determined entirely, however, nanos however many nanoseconds ago, you needed to determine it in order to produce the gesture that generates it, uh, or, or whether, it was, uh, whether it was notated, imagined, conceived, determined thousands of years ago. There's nothing in the sound about that. So the proposal is that what we can do is begin with the acceptance of the phenomenon itself, the fact in the room, on the loudspeakers, wherever it is, wherever it's being experienced, and of course each is different, in the imagination, for example, of reading a score begin with this phenomenon, and then work backwards from that through a series of decisions, of practices, of conventions, of technologies, of constraints. I think of these as modes of inscription, the decisions particularly. At each point, uh, something is determined about what will happen. Each phenomenon, each current phenomenon, thus has its own unique map of inscription a map of inscription that's distributed through time, but through social structures, through technologies, through all these different kinds of inscription. So when we conventionally, in conventional parlance, distinguish improvisation from other practices, we're usually dealing with a very restricted window in time. There are sketches by Beethoven, by Stravinsky, that are effectively notated improvisations that find their way into what we think of as compositions. And nobody practices as obsessively as an improviser. So we might think of the wider structuring as macro improvisation. I don't know, a, a choreographer making work with, with dancers on the basis of some concept that they've evolved over time, for example. But also micro improvisation. If the violinist at the back of the seconds doesn't improvise continuously, the whole thing will fall apart. 
So it becomes a question of parameters. And if we restrict ourselves to thinking about which note or which gesture comes next, then we're really impoverishing performance. Another fallacy of improvisation is the implicit identification of subject, of improviser, with, with material, with phenomenon. There's a wonderful film of Picasso improvising in the 50s, painting on glass, begins with no particular um, plan, no particular image. He just puts brush to glass. And then things begin to emerge. And things emerge from the things that emerge. And things are erased from the things that emerge, such that you want to rush up to him and say, no, just a minute, I'll keep that one. You're doing the other. It's the most beautiful thing. So at what point is he relating to what's emerging on the glass? Over what kind of time scale is he imagining, planning, remembering? We remember and we plan, consciously or otherwise. Technology allows inscription in space, of course. It's, uh, it allows well, remote working. It allows me to be talking to you now. Uh, it allows transduction. That is the conversion of any kind of phenomenon or energy on one dimension into pretty much any other, as long as you've got the, the means to do that. But also in time, uh, there's a wonderful early essay by Lyotard, I think from the opening of Earcam in Paris, when he talks about this, he talks about telegraphy, inscription at a distance. And a lot of work with technology tends to ignore the, the temporal component of this. I can now decide, now here, to make something happen in the future, in an indefinite future, on the basis of something in my remote past, something that I don't even know, I can go and find it, modified by conditions I don't yet know. This changes, this capacity, this affordance, think of it how you will, changes, confronts us to think about how we're improvising, how we're improvising with technology, certainly, but the implications of those kinds of consideration for how we improvise in general, in general, how we produce work in general, our practice in general. So technology, as I said, is painfully literal. What is our material here? Is it notes, gestures, pure, if there is such a thing, sound, phrases, textures. It's all this, of course, but then modified by our own subsequent actions. The name of this project, Three States of Wax, comes from uh, some of the early writings of Michel Serre. He was thinking about what the real object of the physical sciences might be. And he suggests that conceiving, the reconceiving of the object of investigation is as crucial as the reconceiving of the kind of knowledge that might be produced or the kind of methodology with which that knowledge might be produced. The nature of the object is transformed uh, with time, with means to interrogate it. So he thinks of it in terms of three stages. And he takes the example of the piece of wax, in fact, from, from Descartes. The first stage is, is geometric. You describe the shape of the thing. So that's what a lot of music technology does. What was the last phrase? What are the notes? What are the rhythms? Uh, Serre calls that Cartesian, geometric. The next stage is to think of its properties. How does it, how plastic is it? How does it conduct other forms of energy? How does it retain uh, distortions over time? The innovations of 19th, late 19th century science, if you like. Appropriate to our time, Serre says, is to think of material as a nexus of information. Not just information about its shape, its nature, which of course evolves with time, with interactions. Not just information about its properties, how it behaves under different conditions. But information about its status as information. Information about every interaction it's had. Information about every use that it's been put to. Information about every interrogation to which it's been subject. Its entire evolving history co with those who would produce knowledge from it. And that's the basis of how we're working here. That's basically what the technology uh, does, in short, in terms of, of what we're playing. How do we think about making stuff with that? Well, we've been working with the ideas of Luciano Floridi. He calls it informational design. He's actually talking about philosophy, but philosophy 
standing as uh, standing for models, modes of knowledge production in general. And that's particularly relevant, of course, to, to what we're doing here. So what we're going to do now is play for a little while. And this is the most uncomfortable of transitions from speaking to playing. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be a little time left at the end if, uh, if anybody would like to, um, to be confused still further.
Thank you. <laughs> a surprise to hear other people in the world in this uh, little ivory tower we inhabit here. Uh, thanks. That's that's um, that's what we have to offer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, if we're supposed to be asking for questions, answering questions, or we should wait for the uh, Q and A uh, a little later. We'll wait for instructions, is what we'll do. Owing to my inability to hear anything from anywhere else. Hello, can you hear me, Jonathan? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Great to have you 
<laughs> beamed out to the world and to us. That was a, a, a stunning performance. Thank you. Thank you. We're at the moment we're fielding, we're trying to field questions from people who have registered. Um, in the meantime, does anybody here have any questions? Okay, so Kate Ryder is interested in what software is at uh, play here? Well, what software is not being used here? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you about how what's going on with mine and then I'll, uh, I'll pass over to Juan. Um, uh, I have a trumpet that's covered in sensors, uh, which I've been developing for 28 years in different forms. Um, and all of that uh, information, there are uh, three microphones, one inside the trumpet, one on the bell of the trumpet, and, and this one here. Uh, all of that information, the other information, the performance information and data goes via Bluetooth to the first computer you can see here, uh, which is running Max, that acts as an interface uh, for everything else, and, uh, and runs my, um, my patch, my patches a combination of things. It also sends uh, analytic information about what it hears, and it listens to Juan as well. Um, I don't know how many out inputs I've got into that. I think seven. Uh, and it sends that uh, to the other computer, uh, which is also running Max, which on the basis of that data then sends uh, um, audio rate control information to Ableton, which uh, I use because uh, that uh, sends eight control voltages out to the uh, modular stuff you can see on the table behind between the two computers um, through a, an expert sleeper's ES9. So uh, I hope that's <laughs> I hope that it's uh, it's not a very simple answer, but that that is. How can you works. can you hear me? Thank you for that. Um, I I have another question. I don't can know I just, if you can I just were. Uh, can, can I just hear me, John? Juan, can I just over hand over to Juan because oh. that's only half the story. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. All right. Well, I'll be brief. Can you hear me here? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I am using basically no computers this time. Look, man, no computer for today. Uh, and basically, the guitar is being processed directly through a mod device's dwarf, which is something like a multi effects processor, but it can also create uh, control voltages, which I'm not using at the moment. And that is a being analyzed and used as control information for the modular system that I have uh, in that little box. And the modular system is running something called Big Paco Leech, which basically allows you to create your own uh, max patches or PD patches or super collider patches and compile them and save them as a, as a modular voice. And in that, I created a, a, an instantiation of something called the Wrangler from Robert Hordake. It's, a, it's a, some kind of stochastic synthesizer, but with audio, uh, audio rate uh, input. So I can control the, the frequency of the noise, basically. The frequency in terms of the pitch, but also the frequency as in how much and how often. And that, in turn, is also being controlled at some point by the signals from the microphones of the trumpet. And the clean output, output of the guitar is going to Jonathan's systems for some additional intermingling as well. That's what we do. Can you hear me? Yeah. Y yes. So um, thank you for that, Juan. Um, we had a session yesterday with Jen Kirby and the question came up about the level of, I guess, control um, that the artist has in relation to the technology through which he or she is performing. And I'm just wondering to what extent do you feel 
that you have control? I, are there algorithms taking place that make decisions for you? Um, or Juan, are you changing sounds for Jonathan? Uh, what way does that work in terms of performance agency? Well, I'd, I'd refer to my uh, initial uh, talk about uh, time frames in improvisation. And working with technology uh, confronts your assumptions about what the time frame is. So by control, I think implicitly you're suggesting control of a specific thing in the specific moment. Uh, and what we're dealing with here are uh, artifacts uh, that are completely controlled, but the control works over much longer time frames. And there might be times uh, you know, within sort of audible relationships, or uh, or they might be over the scale of uh, of the entire performance. So maybe to complement uh, from a from a in the moment of the performance standpoint, the way we work to uh, I, I'm trying to understand the notion of control as in um, the predictability of or repetitiveness of what we produce and how we can get back to those points again. No, I, 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 that's, that's how people tend to judge control. Uh, in that respect, I think that the way we operate is that we create paths for us where anything that we do, uh, we can trace in terms of what will generate, but we move the audible result of that far ahead <laughs> in time. So when it comes back to us, we can interact with it as if it's its own voice, its own performer. That's kind of the goal of the system. But the control might involve, for example, setting up some kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a process because that sounds somehow dehumanized. Uh, but in any case, some kind of musical structure that might have implications for several minutes time. Um, so the control isn't only over, over the apparent present instant, the specious present, as James called it, or as Ed Sarath then you know, elaborated in terms of retention, protention, all this stuff. I can tell you as an example, as an anecdote, how I got involved with working uh, this way. I was working a lot with improvised music uh, in the old days of the LMC uh, in a railway building in Camden. And I was working a lot with very complicated composed music. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's a trumpet player thing, sort of megalomania, but the urge to improvise compositionally, as it were, to improvise structure, to hear something and think, I'd like that to come back in 10 minutes' time, the next or the next time the trombonist does that, uh, but uh, changed according to whatever the cellist is doing there, and on the basis of yet another thing that I hear developing. Uh, that, was the, um, that was the motivation for beginning to, to work this way. The being in the moment, the, the complete innocence of improvisation, this sort of uh, uh, slightly mythological, <coughs> mythical, shall we say, uh, notion of, of the innocence, the, the, the freedom, liberation of improvisation. I remember doing a gig once with Vinko Globokar uh, in his later stage when he would only play with a person one time because he reasoned that once you began to know them, once you developed a relationship with them, that was no longer improvisation in his terms. And uh, we did this gig, it was at Dartington. And afterwards we were uh, in the bar listening to the Trinity College big band. Very, an excellent big band. And um, making conversation in effect, but I was very impressed with these guys. The, you know, each chorus of so-called improvisation uh, was you know, double tempo, an octave higher, never a note outside the, the chord, all this sort of stuff. And I said to Vinko, yeah, um, these guys are very impressive, these, these, these young people, very impressive. And he said, ha, huh, these kids were dead before they were born. And I think what he meant was this music had already uh, ossified, actually, before these people were born. They, the one thing, it, for sure, the heroes would never have done 
was to try and learn by formula to imitate uh, what people had done 50 years earlier. Uh, but I think it's also illustrative of the uh, of the lengths to which you have to go if you're really going to try to maintain this, what I call a, a mythical innocence. I always think of this in terms of Derek Bailey as well, of course, non-idiomatic improvisation. Uh, and of course, you, you recognize Derek Bailey instantly. And one reason for this is his capacity to to free, to, to, to pre, uh, to pre-think, to anticipate the references, the associations, the stylistic implications that any listener in the room might read in to what he's doing. So if that's not a process of remembering and planning, I don't know what is. Yeah, um, that's a very interesting um, theme that we've been discussing here for the last um, two days, this notion of embedded knowledges. And I guess you're talking about a defamiliarization process, you know, how, you know, if, if on the one hand, we have to believe somehow in the, in the nature of what is inside us, but then to add an extra filter on that, to, <laughs> to exclude that seems in a way, I don't know, maybe I need to think this through more, but in a way that is, runs contrary to what one might assume to be the freedom of improvisation. Uh, yeah, I, I referred earlier to the, the obsessive practicing of improvisers. And I think it's exactly what composers do, is constantly find things to put in the path of their own banality. Um, I think uh, finding the appropriate ways to do that is, is what improvisers, what artists do the whole time. The emphasis away from, it seems to me, um, not that it's impossible to come up with something completely new and to try that would be in a way ridiculous because we are dealing with, well, you're dealing with a trumpet. There's, you can't get away from that. That's a kind of a reality, you know, and I play guitar and Nick Roth plays sax. Now, if I start playing the sax, that could be interesting. <laughs> but but would it <laughs> but would it be of any interest? That, that that's the question. So for me it seems to be to take something known and make it new. I mean, who said that? Oldham, I think. That's that, that's uh, that's an old make it new. Um to 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 recreate creatively as it were. I think that that's all that's left to us in a way. I think that's that is also Kirby's an interesting question. challenge. Jen Kirby has a question. Ah, okay. So then go ahead. <laughs> uh, Juan had an answer. I know. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> but that's another question. No, I, I was just going to say that that is something that we debate continuously. I think that the idea of of to what extent the, the unattainability of the performative act on the electronics gets confronted with something that, it, that, that an audience uh, in a concert situation or also in a recording uh, imposes in terms of, of what is expected from the traditional instruments to, to do and how they interact with it. And I think that for us, the interesting challenge is exactly what you were saying, Ben, is how to not shy away from it, not uh, prepare the instruments beyond, uh, beyond the to destroy the capacities, but to embrace those capacities and to allow ourselves to fall on the paths of tradition, recognize that, not run away from it, which is, I think, that what we practice the most, but embrace it and then see whether that leads us somewhere else. Uh, so it's, it's another kind of creative hurdle to, to know that the potential to start playing tunes is there <laughs> at all times and how to not Consciously, not necessarily avoid it, but know that we are dancing with that risk at all times. That's a nice compromise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jen, would you like to ask that question that you've been patiently waiting to do so? 
Hello. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, I w it's interesting, it uh, often comes up with live electronics. People ask about things that are predetermined in improvisation. Um, it rarely gets asked in when it's acoustic instruments, actually, even though there are many, many elements that are also predetermined. Uh, but you seem like you have a very integrated system there. So I was curious, and it's it's very, uh, there's a cyclical process there where things feed on each other. And I was wondering how you think about separating out those components is it one entire system and that if you changed components would that change uh the the improvised piece significantly or do you feel that uh you could you can swap out certain elements and still have enough um informed improvisation to lead that We are gearheads, so we're constantly changing things. And uh, I think that in that constant change, we have found things that work, um, that we gravitate back towards. Uh, but w we, we also, as a, as, a, uh, as a methodology, I think that we, we tend to strip things down quite a bit. So we, when we practice, I think that we leave a lot of the modular stuff on the side. And we try to to see, for example, to, to understand the negotiation between the acoustic instruments or the traditional instruments and the interaction with the with the analysis of the computer and how it, it comes back to us. And we focus a lot on understanding what are the possibilities of that. And then we leave that aside and then we start working only on mostly taming and balancing the, the modulars. And then we leave that aside. And and I think that this this is is constantly growing, and of course, when we start traveling again, I think that things will get reduced necessarily more and more. So we might end up showing up with like a couple of rubber bands and contact mics, and <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, and I think that that's what your work question was aiming towards. Hopefully, even with that, we will be able to share enough of a of a of a learned vocabulary <laughs> that it would still come across as something that that only the two of us could could come up with uh, that, that's really well articulated uh, the, the only thing I'd add, add to that is 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 the notion of um, I don't know what you to call it dimensionality of uh, something you're working with offering different uh, perspectives so sometimes from my point of view I see this in um, Simon Waters calls ecosystemic terms, or uh, Agostino Di Scipio's uh, acoustic ecologies, this sort of situation where the whole thing constitutes, if you like, the environment within which we play. We inform it, it informs us, uh, which you could almost see as an extension of working with, with say, room resonance, for example. Uh, or you might see it uh, at another moment uh, as more Autonomous, autonomous, yeah, but it only does things in these. These uh, both our sy systems, we call them that, only do things if we do things. Uh, they don't have sequences or tunes or chords or even stored sounds or anything like that. Um, in no case do we do that. Um, but what you can do then is think of, and I've tried this in different ways. Think of uh, emergence within the system. So, at what point do the various things, if you think of it like an A life, uh, a sort of agent based um, community, at what point do uh, emergent structures, can you spot emergent behavior uh, within the context of this, of this community of, of agents? And can you then abstract that, identify it, uh, somehow separate it, and allow that emergent behavior? To um, to pursue its own course, or do you simply say, "No, well, I, you know, there was a, there was one happened there. That was nice. Let's just leave it like that." Uh, but I think that th the same questions arrive in composition. You're working with something, and some sort of serendipitous thing happens, and then you have to decide: Well, am I going to am I going to turn that into a thing in its own right? Is that going to live its own life, or is it just uh, neat that it happened there, and uh, that's some indicator of the fact that I had the right things going on for some reason. So, uh, like I said before, for, for my money, I, I, I don't see it as so distinct from from composition 
in that composition is almost is also a time-based, uh, situated, contextual activity. I I think we've exhausted all the questions here, uh, Jonathan. Um, it only leads me to say uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, the thoughts were really stimulating, but the music was also fantastic. <laughs> it was a wonderful performance. Um, so thank you from Ghent. Well, it's been... Uh Thank you so much. Thanks for your attention. And, uh, well, we wish we were there, but uh, next time. It's good to hear you. Thanks. <laughs>